So the purpose really of today is to talk about uh, the current state and the future of historical societies around the country. Um, and uh, you know, probably are aware of some of the issues for some of you who are not uh, working with the historical society or the city, for example. We understand um, some of the challenges, but we're going to pull the curtain back a little bit today so that everybody can see some of the things that we grapple with, uh, struggle with, and try to resolve. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our esteemed panelists. By the way, this was um, Sean's idea, Sean Gladden, former ED. Uh, he and I, hey, he and I were talking um, talking over the summer about do it, having him come back and doing something. And this was his idea, so I want to give him credit for that. And, uh, and also uh, turn it over to this crew on the stage, these wonderful people who are going to introduce themselves. Good afternoon. Um, my name is James Keffer. I'm uh, from the Historical Society of Baltimore County. I've been there about uh, four and a half years. Before that, I was at the Baltimore Museum of Industry for about a dozen years, which is where I met Sean when we both worked there. Um, and so I to talk about uh, historical societies behind the curtain. Um, my name is Sean Gladden. I am the current executive director at the Cumberland County Historical Society in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I was the executive director here for like eight and a half, like nine years. Um, before that, I um, did work for the Baltimore Museum of Industry. I was curator of collections and exhibits. Um, I've also worked for um, the Fells Point Maritime Museum, and uh, I got my start at the Maryland Historical Society as an intern and worked for them briefly. So I'm a 20-year museum uh, professional, and i um, glad to be here today. Um, and the reason I suggested this when Mark called me was he said, hey, you want to come and do a talk in September? And I said, I don't have any topics I can speak on, and I'm not doing another floods talk. So, <laughs> so we came up with this. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcus Nix. Uh, I have served as the curator for the Howard County Center of African American Culture, tucked away in the heart of Columbia, right off Little Patuxent Parkway, near Columbia Mall, and Merriweather, and Whole Foods. Uh, and so I've served in that capacity uh, for uh, slightly under a year. Uh, prior to stepping into that role, uh, I uh, was in the Howard County Public School System as an educator. Seven years uh, of that stint of time was middle school, and five years was high school, where I taught African American Studies seminar. So my background is in African American Studies, African American History and Culture. Uh, and so I spent that time before I decided to pivot and transition recently into the museum sector, into the museum world. And so I used to be sitting alongside a dear friend here, Sean. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm from Howard County, grew up in Howard County. Howard County means a lot to me, and I'm glad to be a part of this conversation because I do believe this is definitely a timely discussion that should be had. So glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Wonderful. I'm very glad to be here. My name is Ann Bennett. I'm the executive director of the Laurel Historical Society. Uh, so right down the road from everyone here today. And we are a small community museum and archive. We interpret the history of Laurel from its early beginnings as a cotton mill all the way through present day, uh, and including all four counties where Laurel is currently located, including Howard County. So I want to see everyone in this room uh, make the trek down to <laughs> Laurel. Uh, my background is in museums, but before that, I was uh, also involved with archaeology and education as well. So. Very excited to learn and to be part of this uh, and to um, have a great day with everyone here today. All right, thanks guys. So uh, the way we're gonna do this, I'm gonna ask questions. Um, one person is gonna take the lead on it and then others can chime in. Um, I'll kind of be the moderator and timekeeper, so to speak, so you know, I'll keep track of time and make sure we can get to all the questions. Okay, so the first question, um, tell us about your membership. What are the demographics? What concerns do you have about membership? And what efforts have you made to grow membership? So we're going to start with Anne. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, so yeah, this is a huge question. I'll just be as brief as I can. So the way I interpreted this question is that 
we have about 200 members who uh, will, you know, kind of pay to belong on an annual basis. So that's what I'm counting as a member. But that also includes a fair amount of life members, which uh, are wonderful uh, longtime supporters of the organization. But after a certain point, uh, honestly, they are not very cost effective for our organization. So at this point, we're kind of losing money uh, on a couple dozen of our life members. But uh, we're very thankful because they do represent the uh, older generation, the people that are financially secure, that have extra resources and free time, and they are very generous with it to us, with their free time, with their support, uh, with our programs and coming to our exhibits. Uh, we do have a fair amount of business memberships, like some corporate uh, sponsors and things like that, and we have a fair amount of turnover. We're trying to do more conversions from our member, uh, from our programs to being members or donors or sponsors. So, uh, for example, a couple years ago, kind of in the first year of the pandemic, we did a webinar on the history of Halloween. And with that, we partnered with, uh, if anyone has been to Main Street Laurel, you have been to the Crystal Fox. Does that sound? <laughs> if not, it's a wonderful kind of, uh, new Age uh, Wicca um, uh, crystal shop on Main Street, and we partnered with them, and so that was a way to bring in new audiences. So we're trying to capitalize and convert friends and families that way, uh, families from our summer camp, for example, and so we have been uh, kind of taking the challenges that have presented itself from uh, an aging population to kind of turning and cap capitalizing uh, and building those relationships where we can, one-on-one uh, -on -one relationships with parents from the summer camps uh, to volunteers and to webinar attendees. Um, just briefly, uh, our concerns are for membership are similar to our concerns for other areas of the museum uh, community, and that is appealing to diverse audiences, getting uh, different perspectives and stories to tell the complete story of Laurel, uh, but also appealing to different generational interests and needs. Uh, so for example, generation, what is it, Z now, or millennials, they have a different sense of belonging than previous generations. And so it's a way to capture them, bring them in, and appeal uh, to their interest, uh, as in addition to some of the older generations with different needs. Uh, and then finally, in terms of growing membership, like I had mentioned, we try to be a little more, I guess, holistic in our perspective on who is a quote unquote member. So we try to uh, build relationships with our volunteers. We get our volunteers to then become paying members. Uh, we are very good at twisting their arms to become board members or committee members. Uh, so we have a really good one on one relationship with them. And because we are a small museum, we can be flexible and we can uh, accommodate different interests and different needs uh, and really kind of build that interest and then take them level by level uh, to where they're interested and then they fulfill the needs of our organization. So I think that's all I wanted to say. I'll pass it over just down the line. Feel free to add anything. Uh, memberships. Well, I, as I answer that, I think it's probably helpful to give some context to the situation that I have been in for a little while. So our museum, the Howard County Center of History and Culture, uh, actually, even though it was founded in 1987 by Wiley and Sims Birch, uh, who was very active uh, back in the day at being an avid collector of uh, African-American cultural artifacts, uh, collectibles, souvenirs, uh, just you know many things that uh, tie to uh, black history, uh, she uh, would end up, in time, uh, developing a, a, a model where her family, friends, would, and community would rally their support around her. And when she passed in 2014, those who were supporters actually picked up the pieces and continued to keep things going. So as far as the membership, much of the members and those who were actively involved trying to support were really those who were close to Wileen and those who were close to the board members. Uh, in 2020, there was a flood that took place in our facility on the second floor. Pipe burst, I believe it was in the heart of January or something like that. Water went everywhere. And in our two-story institution, looks like a house on the outside. That was a big, big danger, a big hazard, because the prospects of water being everywhere on both floors 
brought about the possibility of mold, water damage, being able to salvage and preserve our collectibles. So, when it, so really, uh, fast forwarding even from there, 2023 in February is when the museum had its grand reopening to finally recover uh, from that flood and try to represent itself back to the community. So the ID, so the, the thought of memberships was at, at the forefront of one of the things that had to get addressed. And so when it comes, when it came to membership, just trying to build those relationships and get the word out that the museum even exists. Because for so long, uh, many did not know, even though, as I said, the museum was established in 1987, many did not know the museum existed, what its role in the community was, uh, and what its mission and purpose was. So as I was brought there, uh, one of the things that I tried to do with as a curator was really get people in the museum. And as people are brought into the museum or as they're engaged online, social media, then this could be able to gain, um, garner familiarity. And then people could then perhaps consider becoming a member. What do we offer in our membership packages? How do we engage all aspects of our community? Uh, and so uh, and those questions are still questions that are being thought about. Those are questions that are still um, being pondered upon. Uh, but I would say at the heart of memberships is relationship building. Relationship building is critical. And it's probably not the last time I'm going to say it in this conversation. Relationship building is very, very important uh, in terms of uh, those who want to be members, donors, uh, or uh, you know those who can assist the facility and the maintenance and the upkeep. Just about in every aspect of the operation, I say relationships on some level play a part. So that's basically where our institution has been. So for those of you who know me pretty well, you know I'm a baseball guy. And one of the things about baseball is we are all consumed with our statistics and analytics. Well, I take the same approach when it comes to museums. You can tell the health of a museum or a historical society by its members, by its active members, and um, by the revenue that's generated from that. So the institution I work for um, is a larger institution. We have 911 members. And of that, um, that's approximately about sixty-five dollars to $70,000 a year of our operating revenue. My, as a, our operating budget at the Cumberland County Historical Society, we're basically an $800,000 a year organization. So when people ask me, tell me about your organization, 900 members, $800,000 operating revenue, which basically for most of the organizations I've worked at, that's basically the ratio. It's about 6 to 10% of your operating revenue comes from your membership dollars. Now, how do memberships, what, what is the challenge with memberships? Obviously, the challenge with memberships to a historical society are demographics. Um, any board will tell an executive director, we want to grow our membership. And they'll always say, we want to get younger. Okay? That, is a, that is a very, <laughs> that's a way basically to say that we, and nothing against all of you fine folks here today, but look around, this is our demographic for historical. Okay, all, all across the board, this is what historical societies generally, their target members are 50 plus with disposable income. Because not only do members provide us with your membership dollars, you are also our first go-to when we look for sponsors or donors or major gifts to the organization. So you're stakeholders in the organization that you belong to. Um, that's one of the reasons why you get invited to the annual meeting and that members are all a part of to some extent, the decision making that goes on within a, a historical organization. Now, having said that, how do we get younger? And I think this will be addressed a little bit later, and I will pat my, my friend Marcus on the back, say all of my colleagues here, programming is a great way to get younger. Um, if you want to bring in younger audiences, do younger or oriented programming. For those of you who are members know that when I was here, I did music. Here, I tried to do concerts here at the museum. We tried to do children's programs. I think I saw Ann, Ann um, is here, uh, education director here. And you know, our children's programs here and the popularity of those eventually led to, uh, to this organization doing what we have next door, which is the Children's Museum. So this organization is already looking to the future because those, those, who, those families who are coming here Eventually, you want them to become members and generational members, and you want them to stay. So from a, from a standpoint of how do you bring in new audiences and younger audiences, 
you got to diversify your programs for sure, too. Um, I'm sure something else we'll talk about with the historical societies. Historical societies has have typically been elitist societies. We'll talk a little bit about how historical societies were formed, but they weren't formed by everyday folks like us. Historical societies generally start as a collection of a wealthy family, many times, sometime in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So now, as we look at historical societies in today's society, we can't just rely on wealthy donors and members. We have to get as many members as a part of what we're doing as possible. So growing your membership is key and vital to the health of your organization. Uh, well, I guess, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm from the uh, education side of this business before I was uh, executive director, so I'm used to talking without a mic and being loud enough for this room. So I'll, pardon me if I'm going to take a little adjusting to using the mic here. Um, uh, I guess I'll give a little more context uh, since I did a, apparently a too brief introduction. <laughs> the Historical Society of Baltimore County uh, was founded in 1959. Um, and it's in a, the last county almshouse in Baltimore County, up in Cockeysville. Um, almshouses were kind of a combination of um, poorhouse, um, senior home, mental institution, all these kind of things rolled into one. And but it was offered by the the county and by the government. So it was a. It's one of those things that when you look back at the history and some of the things that happened in them, uh, you have to remember that it was progressive for its day, though none of it would seem progressive to us now. Um, but in any event, um, so we have uh, about, uh, we, are, we have a little over 300 members uh, right now, and for, by Sean's metrics, also um, about an $80,000 budget, so much, much smaller <laughs> than his. Um, and we also have about, uh, another thing I do pay attention to is kind of some of the um, online side of things. And we have about 4,000 um, followers in our Facebook and, in our, and that are active in our, um, our group in our Facebook, which is kind of more of a community page of people sharing different things related uh, to county history. And that, that we're lucky that that has a lot of action kind of going in it. Um, uh, oh, I should say also for what Anne was speaking with before, we do also have a portion of those members are our life members as well. Uh, same issues, same problems with that. Um, uh, we haven't offered it for. I don't know, 20 years or so, but it is. But we still have many of them with us, thankfully, and uh, and they are still supporters in in a different way. Um, and let's see, we were also talking about oh, um, and I, and we have this in terms of the demographics uh, and things. We, I I will match this demographic here. Ours looks very similar. Our programs look much like this um, normally, and we do have. And I think it's a pretty common issue of amongst all historical societies, as we've been saying, uh, that. You know, everybody says, well, we want more members, and we would like to get younger, and we would like more diversity to show in it, and it's, and, you know, it's, it's challenges that we're all working on, and uh, just saying it doesn't get it done. We have to do things. I, I agree with Sean. It's a lot of times about offering programming or exhibits or things that speak to different audiences. If you keep doing those same things, you're going to keep attracting the same people. It's not that, that part's not too complicated. Um, but you'd be surprised sometimes how often, you know, there's pushback about it, and people say, well, but we like this and we like that. Well, we'll keep offering those. But we also have to mix in some other things if we, if we would like to can make the organizations be healthy, to be able to survive down the road and have people that are supporting us later. Um, so, you know, that is, that is a thing we all kind of have to, to work towards with it. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question really has to do with uh, collections. So Marcus, I think you're uh, slated to start with this one. Describe your collection. How do you manage the collection, and what challenges do you face? So when it comes to the collection, uh, as I said before, Wiley Sims Birch, much of what the museum would end up having would be a foundation of what she started off collecting. So our uh, collection really is a mixture of African and African American artwork, uh, African American collectibles, African American Americana. Uh, uh, we also have uh, masks, uh, sculptures, even busts, figurines. Uh, that's really diverse in that it covers a range of local African American history, 
Maryland history, and even more broadly, national and uh, history of reflective of the African experience throughout the diaspora. And so uh, with the museum, for those who will decide to come to uh, our museum, we have three exhibits. The first exhibit in our largest gallery space is entitled Geography of Resistance, Underground Railroad Network to Freedom, which is fitting with it being September 1st, and this is International Underground Railroad Month. Also, the second uh, uh, exhibit that we have in room number two, and everything is on the first level, is uh, citizenship, civil rights, and the struggle for human rights. Um, and so that basically takes us post-Civil War Reconstruction, Jim Crow, on into World War II, on into uh, living history, present-day pioneers. And then lastly, in room three, the global di Af African diaspora experience. And so, uh, as I said before, just having to pick up the pieces uh, and restructure the organization based on the flood, trying to recover from that, much of the work was getting into past perfect. And for those who don't know what past perfect is, past perfect is like the brain of museums, uh, 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 historical society. So we had to first see what we still salvaged, what we still could preserve, what survived the flood, memberships, all of those things could be accounted for in past perfect. We had to back up the files because our museum has a unique situation where we have our uh, research and library center on campus at Howard Community College, but our headquarters is actually in Vantage Point right near historic Oakland Manor residents at Vantage Point. So we were in an interesting dilemma where we had a lot of our information uh, and our data past perfect housed on site at HCC. So we had to first back up the files up, update the stuff, and then transfer it to our institution. And this is where a lot of the information on our collection uh, is, is housed. So you can imagine a curator like myself had a grand old time, you know, me, myself, and I, part time at that, going through all of the, the hoops to try to recover all of those things. Uh, I would also say when it comes to the collection, and I see that a lot of times, museums, small museums, but I won't even just limit it to small museums. I think this is just a museum challenge and even historical societies as well too. Being cognizant of what you accept, what you take in, being sure that you are true to your mission and vision, making sure those who are in your organization and those who are on your board and those who are on your team are on the same page, because one of the things that could happen is if you take stuff that has nothing to do with the mission, vision, and purpose, some of that funding that should perhaps be allocated over here may go towards storage. And I can say even the National Museum of African American History and Culture, for what I've been told, has warehouses and warehouses of stuff that it does not even have on display because it has to have storage. So we know storage is important. However, once again, when it comes to the collection, it should be in alignment with what the museum's mission, vision, and purpose is. And what's interesting, and I said here to um, Sean and Paula before, there's been times I was about to go home, leave in the museum, and I almost walk out the door and stumble over something. It's like a statue that has nothing to do with African American history and culture. It looked like it might have been like an Asian uh, statue or whatever, um, dropped off on the front porch. <laughs> Absolutely. And so when it comes to the collection, number one, making sure that those who need to know and those who are aware understand the paper trail, the history, the documentation. There's also a legal process whenever uh, Doc, um, uh, items of, uh, are donated and brought into the museum. Also making sure that those, whether it's docents, volunteers, uh, uh, whoever, they know how to handle those collectibles. You just don't handle artifacts. You just don't handle precious collectibles. So how you handle those items, you know, even, even our flood, you know, the thermostat and the temperature, you know, uh, all of the, and there's so much that could be said, but there's just so much to think about when it comes to the collection. Um, so that was the world that I was in, just trying to make sure 
you take care of the collection. Uh, even something as small as putting signs up, don't touch this, don't touch that. So when you do bring those children in for those programs, it can still be respectful of those items and those artifacts as well too. So there's a lot to be said about the collection, but um, I'll just leave that back for now. Uh, yeah, uh, I was gonna move on to the next, yeah, just because we're you know, about a half hour in. Um, okay, so uh, Jamie's gonna start this one because he um, actually has a connection to this question. Um, what are some efforts uh, that help to foster collaboration with similar groups uh, in your area? So, um, one of the things that uh, that that one of the first things I found out about our historical society when I started um, was, you know, Baltimore County. Uh, everyone's local enough has a mental picture of what Baltimore County's shape is, kind of surrounding the city on all sides and going all the way up to Pennsylvania. Um, and historically, it was far larger than that. It was about, you know, all of these counties were Baltimore County if we go back far enough. But um, it's a pretty big county. And it's spread out. And, you know, uh, it doesn't all interact with itself all that much. If you're down here on this, you know, side over in Catonsville, or if you're on, you know, over in Sparrows Point or Essex or Dundalk or way up in uh, North County, way above us, it's, it's kind of like you're in separate places. And, so um, something that we kind of realized, I right, realized right away, is that historically, for the 60 plus years that our historical society's been there, we've really been uh, the historical society of north central Baltimore County more than we've been of the whole Baltimore County. And so that's something we're trying to change. But the best way, you know, I said before, we're very small. I'm the only paid staff. We have uh, a lot of great volunteers, but, um, but it is limiting, and we don't have and we don't have a huge budget, so we're not going to suddenly have other locations all around the county. So what can we do? We can partner with other organizations that are around the county, and uh, or in the surrounding counties, and and meet people where they're going to be, and find ways that we can find overlap of missions to to do that. So that's been a, a large strategic goal for us, and a couple of ways that we've had some success with that. Um, we had a, a traveling Smithsonian exhibit uh, a couple of years ago, and we, we've actually done a couple in the last four years, um, but this, this last one we did was called Voices and Votes, Democracy in America, and we hosted the Smithsonian part of the exhibit at uh, the Community College of Baltimore County in Dundalk, and so that was, uh, you know, one, given the subject, we thought it would be good to, to partner with the school for that and put it near students. And we also wanted to get that kind of down on another part of the county from something we had done before. Um, we, the previous one of those exhibits we had was Waterways, and we partnered with, with Sean down here, and we had students from Lansdowne High School that did a student film to support it. It was filmed in Ellicott City about, about of course, what else? Flooding. And <laughs> so that was another opportunity to partner with it. But uh, a more recent effort, and, um, oh, and as a, as also as a part of the Voices and Votes one that we just did, we had um, kind of a preview exhibit for it um, before it was open at four different library branches that were spread all around the county. So in Arbutus and in Owings Mills and in um, Perry Hall and in uh, North Point on the other side. So we really found that there's an appetite from at least our county library for exhibits and we're, we're you know, going forward, that's something we're really planning on doing more of because of the traffic that they get is so much more diverse and in terms of in all in every category <laughs> and so much larger numbers than we get. But the other more recent thing we've been doing that we're very excited about is we've recently uh, gotten a grant to form what we're calling the Baltimore County Heritage Network. And what we found is there's really tons of other small history organizations all around our county and history related things. And rather than us all try to compete with each other and let's all not know if we have programs on the same day or People have to go to all these different websites or Facebooks or wherever they go to see what we've got going on. Why don't we have a central place that that can all be found? Why don't we have a page? Why don't we have a, a monthly e-newsletter that sends out a collection of everything that's going on around the county that's related to history? Because what we found is most of the people who are interested in one of us are really interested in most all the other ones as well. So um, we got that newsletter and that page launched this spring. And we're up to 20 organizations in the, in the network now. Um, that are all, all in Baltimore County and all uh, history-related or adjacent organizations. We're being pretty loose about it. Um, and really all it is is just that we have this, this collected place to do that 
And also, because we're many of us very small, and many of them smaller than we are even, um, it gives us a chance to um, have professional training and professional development sessions and things like that as a group, um, because they, they tend to be more productive that way than if you just have it for a couple of people, right? So um, that's, it's given us a chance to kind of band together and, and work, work like that as well. So um, we're, we're big proponents of partnership and collaboration wherever we can. All right, thanks for that, Jamie. Um, so the first set of questions we asked, or I asked, nice folks responded to, really was the current state of historical societies. And, and we did want to pull the curtain back a bit, and I think you heard some things like, you know, the, uh, the baby, uh, leaving the baby at the doorstep <laughs> with uh, uh, Marcus's examples, um, talking about the need for um, having a wider, more diverse, and younger um, membership, which is always a challenge for all of us, um, and also the, the challenge of, of um, membership and ensuring that you have um, a strong membership and people engaged. So the next set of questions are really about the future of historical society. So the first question, and Sean, why don't you start this one? Um, some historical societies have been rebranded, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit, Sean, um, such as the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Why is that the case, and what are the benefits? So I think there's a couple of benefits to rebranding yourself or rebooting yourself or whatever you want to call it. I've seen this. And actually, we're currently going through this at my location because we're engaging in a long-range plan. And part of our long-range plan is to think about renaming ourselves, rebranding ourselves. And you kind of got to—you got to be pretty mindful of any rebranding that you do because remember, you have legacy members and people who have been stakeholders in your organization that don't like a whole lot of change. However, the the the, the pathway to success is out there, and I'll give you a few examples. Obviously. We know about the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Um, where I come from in Pennsylvania, we've, had, we've seen a, a number of organizations have changed their name. York Historical Society is now the York History Center. Um, Lancaster Historical Society is now Lancaster History. Um, the reason this is happening is because traditionally the words historical society have a very elitist connotation. And there are some audiences, believe it or not, just that word society can sometimes give them a little bit of a, of a, a bad taste in their mouth. So, and I even actually did this here. Many of you members here may not have noticed that when I did this. This used to be the Howard County Historical Society Museum. I don't what it's called anymore. It's now the Museum of Howard County History. Now, <laughs> Now, the reason we did that was primarily a marketing reason. At the time when Paulette and I were, were running the show here, we wanted to do a lot of different things here. We wanted to do weddings. We wanted to do concerts and different programs. And I can even tell you, like, when I was talking to bands, that I wanted to get bands to play here. And I'm like, hey, will you play at the Howard County Historical Side Museum? They're like, nah, I'll pass, man. <laughs> or how would you like to play in the Museum of Howard County History? Yeah, that sounds cool. Same place, different name. And believe it or not, actually, our visitation here did grow significantly after we changed the name. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. We did a marketing push with that. We changed the signage down on Main Street. So rebranding, there's nothing wrong with it. And even if you do it, I mean, think about it this way. It's a great opportunity for you as an organization to reconnect with new audiences. And I'll give you a great example. Adams County Historical Society. I just went and visited them last week. And they're right in Gettysburg. It's awesome, absolutely. They spent a lot of money on that place. 15 million, well here's what that 15 million got them. Before they built that building, okay, um, now they didn't change their name, but they did name that building something different. Um, they, they had 400 members before they built that new building. You wanna know how much they have right now? 3,400 members. And flush with cash. So, and that was just simply, now granted, they're in Gettysburg. <laughs> and, and Ken Burns and, and, and Jeffrey Shaw serve on their board, so that helps. But still, that's a great example of how a slight change reboot brings in new audiences. And now we went there, and they're, they're slammed every day. They, they, and they're charging 15 bucks for people to get in there. So 
Rebranding is a good thing, and to be honest with you, it is the future. You, I think the word historical society will kind of become a little more passe. You'll see a little bit more of history center, um, you know, um, kind of what Lancaster's doing, Lancaster history and things of that nature. So it's, once again, it's all a part of reinventing yourself and reaching new audiences. Sean explaining that. Um, so uh, the next question is, um, there are many smaller organizations, and I think Jamie was referring to this um, a little earlier, um, historical societies, friends groups, et cetera. As these organizations lose members um, and leadership, their collections are in danger of being lost. What responsibility do organizations such as ours have in uh, taking in these collections? So let me ask a question real quick. Is is the Savage Historical Society still uh, Savage? Is the Savage Historical Society still active? Okay. Great example. So right here you have a great example of this. All right. So when I was the director here at the Howard County Historical Society, I tried to keep partnerships with our other I call them our partner organizations, the Elkridge Heritage Society, Savage, um, Historic Ellicott City, um, because once again, partnerships and collaborations are important. But as the Howard County Historical Society, you know, our mission were, was to collect and preserve items of enduring value to Howard County. So I think it is, it is our duty if, if an organization like the Savage Historical Society or Elkridge or, or or other places fold or downsize and they can't care for their collection anymore, I think it is the responsibility of the larger organizations to care for that because that's why we're all here. We're here to collect and preserve history. So turning your back on an organization's collection that is defaulting, um, you're, you're, you're losing your history. Um, I'm seeing this currently up in Pennsylvania. I'm a large organization in a very large county, and there are smaller organizations. One of them just recently came to me and said, we can't afford to pay our bills anymore. Will you, will you be our daddy organization? Literally, that's what they said. And um, we're working on it because we feel an obligation to do that. So the smaller organizations are struggling. Um, the question is, is how do we keep it? Although they are struggling financially, the mission and the, and the collections that they our stewards of are still very important and need to be saved. So we as a community really need to make sure that we are trying to do that. But these things cost money. So this, this is the conundrum. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, well, just kind of come at a different angle uh, about of the topic. Um, I think maybe, you know, in terms of giving some transparency to everyone about how it works in us, um, we all have, um, we all have plans and things on paper and written for what if, what if, have, you know, what if there's a flood, what if there's damage to the collection, but also what if the organization is going to go away, what, is, what happens to all your stuff? And so you have written down what are the other organizations that overlap that you would attempt to make sure you find good homes for everything to. Um, so that's all kind of a part of of the way it works. It's something else uh, Marcus brought up before, the, the you know, the, the, I'm sure we've all experienced the idea of something got left on the doorstep or, you know, being more careful when you, what you take in. I think what uh, I think a lot of people don't realize is, you know, don't realize if you haven't participated in it or made a donation, they don't realize the paperwork that goes in and, and all the rules that kind of as an industry we have to follow about it. They'll, you know, how often do we hear, oh, here, just if you don't want it, just just throw it away or don't worry about it or whatever. Well, that's not really how it's supposed to work from our side of it. So um, I think and any organization that's been around any length of time has things in their collection that now they can't explain why they have or <laughs> scratch their head or wish they didn't. And it's, it's, not, it's a lot easier to be more careful coming in. This is like something Mark was talking about, something I remember Sean uh, doing when we worked together at the Museum of Industry of trying to make a more conscious effort of being careful of what's coming in because uh, as Marcus was saying, that's you know every every extra thing is a thing that's keeping you from properly caring for the 
the good thing she had. So um, I think that's something we're all trying to do, you know, better. But nobody has ever done perfectly um, at any organization in terms of having, you know, the perfectly selected. And part of that's because it's a it's a moving goal. That enduring history um, phrase is a good one because you know we're only doing our best at guessing what 50 years from now someone will think was a good choice of a collection item. And sometimes you just have to kind of take your best shot at that too. So. Say a few things real quick. I think that it's also important for boards and organizations uh, that we're speaking to on this panel to really think about succession planning. How can museums, uh, how can hit centers of history be around long term? What does that look like? Uh, and I think there's a lot to be said about that. Perhaps being open to new ideas, innovative thoughts. Uh, I know it was said before, perhaps those that might be uh, governing much of the operations of the institution perhaps might be a certain age. And so perhaps clinging to the past and being so uh, committed to the past that there's a closed mindedness of embracing the future, of embracing newness. Uh, and that happens oftentimes uh, from what I've observed when you perhaps may have a team that might be not museum professionals might not be trained individuals yet. They might be used to running the show, yet now here comes academics or trained professionals. How, can we tra how do you transition and work together with succession planning? Long-term vision is very important. Um, and I think it's hard for a lot of these institutions when they're trying to just make it from one fiscal year to the next. We're just trying to get from one grant to the next. We're trying to get from you know perhaps this political figure granting us something and then hoping and praying that we have something for the next. But more of a long-term vision. And then the next thing I'll say in terms of responsibility, looking all around the country, seeing the efforts to minimize and erase history, especially black history, African-American history, as a curator, I had to be very intentional about how those narratives and stories were told, especially in Howard County. When you come in, what are people seeing? What are they engaging with? What are they observing? What are they seeing? Um, I know from interacting with the uh, Howard County Office of Tourism, uh, you know, it was, it was brought to my attention that, you know, those who come in to visit, much, many of those who visit our county want to learn about local history and visit historic sites. And I know there was a study in 2021 by the American Historical Association about um, those many individuals from 18 to, to 65 trusting the museums, the institutions that we're talking about more than any other um, source of history. So there's a lot of pressure, uh, yet there's an opportunity to perhaps provide counter narratives and debunk some of those long ingrained myths that have been woven into the fabric of, of history and how we engage and grapple with history for a long time. So uh, I think there's also responsibility as well to it, how we teach and how we display and how we educate the community of all levels, uh, backgrounds, and, and uh, um, walks of life as well. OK, why, why don't we? Um, why don't we go to the uh, final question, which is a broader question. Um, and uh, this has been a great discussion, and so many things are relevant, I know, uh, for, for me in, in my role. Um, PFI. I'm Karen Griffith, and I've been on the board of the um, Friends of the Perhapsville Female Institute for quite a while. My husband, Hank, got me on the board first. I got off for them. Anyway. After over 50 years, we are closing our doors as far as a group. We have made a partnership with Missouri Mills and City to be a committee of that group. We've also donated some cabinets to the Historical Society and the Miller Library Research Center to um, put our archives. So our archives will be living in a brand new place instead of under that table in my house. And I still will be doing research on all the students who went to the Institute. We had about 1,500, I think, over the 60 years that it was a school. And it's been an eye opener. I grew up on Route 40. I did not go down and graffiti those walls. I just want to let you guys know that I was very close. Anyway, we are very excited to keep going. We will still partner when the county would like us to come up to the site. And it's, um, it, it's been a great uh, experience for us. So it, it will live on. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Karen.
and we just stored you in there. So all of our archives are now just sort of piles of just messy drawings. But it's trying to form a big robust And the, and the challenges are not limited to, um, to just historical societies. It's also um, even our county uh, Department of Recreation and Parks operating facilities. Hi, Tiffany. I'm looking at Tiffany back there, who's <laughs> who is, uh, uh, works in the Heritage, what used to be the Heritage Division. Um, and, you know, they operate six sites, um, historic sites, plus a lot of land. Um, and their staff is small. And they, they, they struggle as well. So, um, so it's not just uh, organizations like ourselves. It's also even our, our, our county. Um, I mean, think about uh, like Bland Air. Uh, that, that was supposed to be a historic park. It's still sitting there, neglected. Um, Tiffany. Okay, that's great. And and PFI as well. Uh, there's yeah, there's a lot more to the story than what you read in the paper. I'll just say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, last question, and we'll start with Anne. Um, Looking ahead, what changes should historical societies make to remain relevant and serve the public? Hey, thank you, Mark. Uh, so I did do my homework for in preparation to answer this question. I consulted my magic eight ball, and it said, <laughs> it said uh, "Outlook hazy." Uh, ask the question again later. Um, but uh, no, in all in all seriousness, I think the best answer to that question. Uh, because, again, nobody knows the future or how trends can come and go, but uh, the solid answer to that question is do the work the community needs you to do uh, and to be a relationship builder, be a team player, and do the work in the community. Uh, and if you don't know what that work is, go out and find the answer. Uh, work with as many different people and partners and organizations uh, as you can, and certainly Things like lecture series and webinars like we do are great, but maybe the community needs an after school program or panels in Spanish or something like that. So uh, it's about you know being relevant and fulfilling the needs in the community uh, from many different perspectives. And uh, that goes back to one of the earlier questions in terms of collections care, uh, or what are the gaps in our collection? And that's one of the things we're planning to embark on in the next couple of years is to look at what we have. We have over 10,000 items in our collection related to Laurel's history, uh, but there are gaps. Uh, there are geographical gaps. Every uh, So much of our collection was based on Old Town, uh, Prince, uh, Prince George Street, Montgomery, Main Street, uh, but what about the other areas that call Laurel home? Uh, and also other gaps from different uh, age groups and different organizations and different ethnic and racial backgrounds. Uh, and so we have to really consider what we have been collecting and what we need to collect, <clears throat> excuse me, as, especially history as it happens. And we be very proactive with collecting things like uh, signs from the COVID uh, pandemic or from the, or the protest for social justice. Uh, so we were very um, active with collecting history as it happens. Uh, and going back to the other question too, I don't think we have any plans to do a name change, but um, if you're, it's going to change the name. We have to do it because it's reflecting your new identity. It's reflecting the work you're doing. It's not just 
changing the name and still continuing with the same old, same old. So if you have a new vision, if you have this passion for the community uh, and serving all different audiences and doing different work related to your mission uh, and fulfilling the needs of the community, uh, then you know that's the real important thing. You can have that same, same name, uh, but then just be uh, the player that the community needs you uh, to do. And that's really one way to be relevant, but also to be trustworthy and building those trust relationships, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with your volunteers or members, uh, or on a larger uh, scale with different organizations, uh, governments, and other partner organizations in town. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess the last thing I wanted uh, just to mention is that, uh, again, the biggest way is just to be welcoming and be as inclusive as possible and try to break down all barriers to learning. And that would be physical barriers, uh, you know, with, in terms of accessibility, but also accessible barriers on our website and with our programming. Uh, and then also with a paywall, you know, making it very economically accessible as well to all different groups in Laurel and beyond. So those were a couple of my <laughs> questions or answers to the question on how we can be relevant, um, but be very authentic and trustworthy uh, in, in doing that and fulfilling a different mission going forward with the Historical Society. I'm going to quote Mr. Uh, Nat Austin, who's been our museum executive director. Um, and he always talks about um, who, who moved my cheese. There's a book he oftentimes references, who moved my cheese, government cheese. And so when we talk about the futuristic scope of these institutions having multiple streams. So as I mentioned a little earlier, perhaps the funding, whether it's grants, memberships, uh, donations, uh, admissions, uh, sponsorships, a mixture of all of those things are important. Long, long range vision, long term planning. Uh, I would also say in the, the programming, uh, education, what are the ways that the, what are the different ways that the community can engage with what it has, is that you have to offer? Uh, one of the things that we ended up doing was a living history oral history project where we actually brought in descendants from historic African American communities of Howard County. And now you see all types of developers moving in, pushing over old historic property that at one point in time, or historic black enclaves, settlements, and communities, where we had those who were still living come into our midst, we interviewed them, got their story, and the vision is to push it out on YouTube for the community. YouTube, social media, being up to date, being, you know, marketing and promotion, being relevant. Uh, also, everybody's not going to come to you. You got to also get out into the community. You got to get out into the schools. You got to get out into the libraries. You got to get out to where the community, where the people are. And that's one of the things we did. So we also had a traveling museum on the go program. Student internships. You know, another way is to bring in young people to have fresh ideas, a new innovative vision and new thoughts. And we had a student internship that we had with Howard Community College. And those students uh, learned about local history, learned about museum upkeep and operations, and they also uh, were able to share with us. It wasn't just us giving them, they also gave us ideas. Hey, put some QR codes there, or what about talking about this, or the website looks a little bit outdated, or whatever the case may be. So, you know, having young people as well in the midst. And I would also say, once again, just making sure that uh, the board are those who govern the institution are on the same page. Uh, everybody's vested. Uh, and I think diversity of thought on boards is important as well, too, uh, because oftentimes what can happen is those of the same mindset, those of the same way of thinking, it could be definitely detrimental to the future goals uh, of, of, of the institution as well, too. Um, I don't have too much on this. That, that I, I completely agree with everything Marcus and Ann were just saying. Um, just one thought I had while he was talking about that that really was sticking out to me is um, while all these great ideas we're, we're trying to do to broaden and to diversify and get younger and all these great things, I do think sometimes it's good to also remem remind ourselves uh, there, that while um, it's, it's easy to always chase these bigger numbers and go for the broader impact, it's also good sometimes to get those um, a deeper impact with a small number or an individual even as well. When you mentioned internships, that's something where we really think about it as 
uh, it's not that we're going to take on, you know, 50 interns. <laughs> but if we have one or two or three at a time, and they have a long-term, deep um, experience with us, and it can make a deep impact with a few, and that's just one uh, example, an internship. But, but there's lots of other ways where sometimes uh, I have to tell myself on a weekly basis, sometimes if I, it's like, well, we didn't reach the masses this week, but I had this nice long talk with this one person who we really helped them, or we really found the answer to their historical question in research, or we were able to work with them to preserve something by taking it or by helping them preserve their house or whatever it was. So, um, you know, it, it is this balance for organizations like us as well. Well, when you're talking to the board or when we're talking to a nice big group like you, it's, uh, you know, we, we get caught up in running the big, but sometimes that deeper impact with, um, with a small group or an individual is important as well. So historical societies were, were mainly founded once upon a time with the idea of exclusivity. So the future of our historical repositories has got to be the opposite. It's got to be inclusivity. And when I'm talking about inclusivity, we've got to make ourselves as historical repositories, museums, um, uh, everyone that works in the historic preservation, we have to be an extension of the community and the services provided to the community. The community as a large may not appreciate their history, um, but they will one day. <laughs> As I tell my students when I was teaching, you know, I'd always get, I was teaching as a, a, a freshman and, and sophomore at Howard, Howard Community College. On the first day, I'd always ask, how many of you like history? Like one kid raises his hand. And I say, don't worry about it, you will one day. Because as I say, people really don't appreciate their history until they have a little history of their own. So we are a vital part of the community. Without us, all of your treasures would go into the trash center. They would. We're going to eBay and go somewhere else. So we are a valuable part of the community. We are an essential part of the community. And I think we as historical repositories need to see ourselves like that. Um, we're a service. And we should provide more services. If you have a historic property like this, this is a great place to do different community-related programs. Don't just be a history museum. Be more than a history museum. Be a community organization. So that is the future. All right. Thank you. Uh, how about a big hand for our panelists?